infrastructure as a service uh, cloud everything anything and everything is a service which means you don't own anything you just use it you just give it back okay that's a service uh, what do you rent that is what do you hire what do you get as part of the rent is uh, that variation makes the difference between iaas paas and saas Ah, uh, excuse me. Uh, Nothing. Can you just mute uh, everybody else apart from you and me? I get. Um, can you see who else? Okay, now it's much clear. Okay, let's let's go ahead. <coughs> let's go ahead. Um, infrastructure as a service, when you get your computing resource at a raw infrastructure level, when you get access to your operating system immediately, that is. if you get to access your operating system via an ssh that is that is for linux and uh, if you are able to do an rd directly instead of just having a portal setting up your uh, just pushing your application and all those things so when you are not restricted to that level um, you call that as infrastructure as a service let me um, uh, just a minute I will bring back the screen shortly. Uh, infrastructure as a service. Uh, the name means uh, getting your operating system at its own base level is as equivalent to getting the raw infrastructure. You access the resource only via uh, SSH, that is secure shell access, or a remote desktop to do your operation. Uh, it is almost your um it your same same uh, thing what you get the same feel the same access the same control what you get on your physical servers you will get the same thing over cloud there is no difference the only difference is it is running on a cloud server and uh, and here it is running in front of your eyes in your own building okay people always call in terms of a virtual machine will say uh, there are virtual uh, how many vms have been launched there are there is also an oxymoron people will be calling as how many physical virtual machines you are running meaning um, virtual machines by itself is means uh, it's virtual and people put the word physical virtual machines but that is very very appropriate in cloud uh, i would explain you how the physical virtual machine term came okay uh the famous examples here are azure virtual machines and amazon ec2 um azure is a cloud offering and azure is offering the cloud in terms of ias in terms of pass in terms of data in terms of network in terms of storage etc and uh, as part of infrastructure as a service azure provides us as virtual machine okay uh um okay and uh, let me see uh here if you see if you see my marker your data center will typically your data center or your physical application you would be having your fundamentally raw hardware here and you will run a virtualization virtualization is a layer for now what you could assume is it is a virtualization you will instead of running 10 small servers you would take one massive big server install a virtualization layer over that Okay, you will install virtualization layer over that. Uh, what does the virtualization layer bring? Uh, there would be twenty servers running in the same server. Okay, all the twenty servers will act as individual, but internally it is all fed by one massive server. Uh, this is the virtualization which you could expect out of your physical data center. and uh, even your cloud data center instead of running one uh, one massive size 
and running 20, it could be sales of one rack can host nearly of 2,000 and uh, 2,000 of servers and uh, it could be allocated based on sizes. That is, you um, make 100 of, out of a very big, very big uh, instance, where you make 100 virtualized instances, uh, it could be a small instance. If you make 50 virtualized instances, it would be a large instance. If you make 25 instances out of the large instance, uh, it would be an extra large. So, so and so. Um, by separation, you will be given separate uh, separate uh, committed resource type of uh, so much of space of RAM, so much of memory, so much of computing power, so much of bandwidth, so much of network latency, etc. Uh, e all the servers will follow the same rule here. Okay. Uh, on top of virtualization, you would patch up your OS, and then you need to take care of not uh, networks, routing, configuration, DNS, uh, LDAP, uh, authentication, uh, DNS, routing, internal DNS, firewall, data, and your application. So you need to take care of every aspect here when it comes to your physical data center. And I told about IAAS, and let's get into PAAS. It's PaaS, Platform as a Service. Uh, you get the access not from the raw infrastructure, but from the platform. The platform could be a uh, Java platform, a platform could be Azure platform supporting Docker, the platform could be Azure platform supporting Ruby, PHP, Python, uh, Node.js, etc. There are so many platforms, uh, so many platforms. And you put your, just your deployed application onto the platform and the rest of the things will be taken care of. And the people will call computing instances or computes in terms of, um, uh, again, the instances, that is virtual images for infrastructure as a service. Uh, you go with these kind of platform as a development when you are not concerned about anything beyond your platform. Say you are happy with .NET Framework 3.5 or 4, uh, let's say you have .NET Framework 4 and you don't need anything more than that. You are assured bandwidth, everything will be fine. And less of the problem is only with the application and you are concentrating only on application. You would go with platform as a, platform as a service. Whereas IAAS, infrastructure of the service, uh, to give a small uh, to, to give a small example, you would be using uh, IAS when you need a specific sophisticated uh, um, uh, log uh, uh, a software which you need to install on the virtual machine for each of your servers. Um, let's say you need Adobe Adobe Media Server to be installed in your machine and uh, along with the uh, along with your web server, along with the Apache or along with the IAS, uh, when you need a lot of configurations and a lot of ground work to be done, even before application, uh, that is web server or the app server installation, you go with the IAS as you need to work with the operating system and below the layers of kernel. Kernel, you don't act, get the access of kernel, you get the access of the operating system and installation and mechanism. That's where you use IAAS, and here is where you use SAS. Next is SAS. SAS is something you get it at the application level. You, me, everybody else here are using SAS for a very long time. One example what I could quote is your Gmail features SAS. How is it SAS? That is, uh, So far, clear? Okay, good. Okay. Um, uh, Gmail, so uh, what are the features supported in your Gmail is will definitely be supported in my Gmail. Okay, uh, there is very, very less number of configurations or customizations what you could do in terms of a SAS. Uh, your Gmail has your username, your password, and your emails and your content, graphs, pictures, and chat logs, and chat messages, contacts, etc. And it is the same thing as mine. And uh, Joe David from uh, uh, Turkey can have his Gmail with the same number of features. 
and we have a restricted access of what uh, how much of data or how deep data I can see. I cannot go and see uh, uh, somebody else data. There is a logical separation. I mean, um, there is a, we can't say logical. There is a separation of uh, what, how much of data, how much of details each SaaS component or each product can be seen. You have very little or you have very domain specific customizations. You can configure what theme of Gmail you could use. You could configure what signature you could use. You could configure what vacation responder you need to use. But you cannot configure uh, something like uh, my Gmail, uh, my Gmail must not be stored in Google's data center, which is present in the USA. It should internally use Singapore data center, etc. Those things, those configurations are not possible, or they are not entertained. Might be they are not possible at all. Even if it's possible, it's not entertained because uh, that is the level of SaaS. Uh, that is that is SaaS. Uh, you you have restricted uh, restricted uh, access or you have domain specific. It's not restricted. It's a domain or uh, feature specific, uh, uh, component specific feature. Why or not you need to will be uh, going and configuring my mails must be sent from uh, Singapore instead of USA. All those things. As long as Google the Gmail is committing you to give the offer or giving the service, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, this is the SaaS. Uh, uh, SaaS is uh, how a product or an end product is being developed. The immediate customers of SaaS will be the immediate customers. That is, SaaS typically means B2C, that is business to customers. And IAAS and TAAS are predominantly B2B, business to businesses. You take a path, put your application and give it to your customer and you are cloud, that is Azure's customer. And your customer may not get the direct access of PaaS, but internet, but instead the application running on PaaS. And same thing with IAAS. So IAAS, PAAS are more, uh, are not strictly, we can't say, it's more like a B2B operation, whereas SaaS is a B2C operation. Okay, now, let's go back and see the positioning of Azure. Okay. Your data center is here. It's not actually a portion of Azure. It's really understanding uh, the services what given by the Azure in terms of uh, whether it is a, a SaaS or PaaS or IAS. Okay. Uh, Azure virtual machines are here. Uh, in virtual machine, you would be given access for OS. You need to configure the OS. You need to take up the routing proto uh, routing inside the uh, servers. You need to take care of the firewall roles, and once you are done in this in this stage, you will put your data, you will put your application, and your uh, virtual machines, your application running out of Azure VM can be moved for production. And this is the IaaS offering of Azure, whereas PaaS first offering of cloud services is. You need to take care of virtual network. That is, underlying OS and platform are fixed. The underlying platform will be .NET Framework. Uh, currently, it is 4.5, um, um, and the servers will be Windows Server 2008 or 2. I'm not sure whether they have migrated to Windows Server 2012 already. Okay. Uh, and for that, you put a data, and you will put your applications. Uh, this is cloud services comes under PaaS operation. Uh, there are something called as Azure websites. If I dig into a little bit of uh, what are the components of Azure, you would better understand. You would have uh, uh, got in sync with the context what I am talking. Azure websites, just you would develop your application. You just put your application. You just put your data and everything will be set. Example, uh, you can bring your WordPress. WordPress requires PHP and MySQL. You could make it run in Azure. And you could turn on, turn off PHP support. If you turn on PHP support, you can uh, set up and deploy all your PHP applications and uh, set up your application, uh, set up uh, set up your PHP applications over the .NET. Okay. So WordPress uh, can be configured on websites, and uh, you don't need to uh, really go deeper into what goes in, what goes the, the firewall rules, with virtual network, etc. Just bring in your application, set up, deploy it, run. That's it. Tomorrow you need a WordPress blog, yes. Drupal CMS, yes. Uh, 
any applications which are which are of the type which are either uh, php and uh, .net they can be uh, they can be run from uh, websites windows azure websites for now it is php and uh, dot php and .net they are currently concentrating on ruby and ruby ruby on rails based thing not sure when it will be released so uh, popular examples are gmail Office 365 and Salesforce.com, they are all come under software as a service. Here we see Azure as a PaaS. Uh, I told about PaaS and uh, Azure Cloud Services are, uh, are the ways or the formats in which uh, Azure participates in the PaaS leap. Okay. In PaaS, web role, worker role, VM role are the ways in which you could uh, set up your cloud services PaaS application. Okay. Um, the platform, as I said earlier, is Windows Server 2008 R2 and develop and deploy your application and put it inside it. During the process or the course of development, you would uh, use your same tools, frameworks. For example, you can use ASP.NET MVC or ESP.NET Web Forms, etc. And you would wrap it over um, Azure Cloud Project. Okay, uh, the Azure Cloud Project will take the reference of, or will be, uh, it will be a wrapper for your application developed in ASP.NET, and the cloud project can be deployed. Uh, for now, let uh, just let's just leave it here. In the forthcoming sessions uh, uh, tomorrow, we can really see it in a code of how things are going. That is, uh, we can really pull in the instance of Azure PaaS cloud services and deploy and see how things are running. Okay. Uh, uh, once your application is developed, you could go to the management console and uh, look at uh, what size you want, what framework you want. That is. Uh, my application just requires an extra small, a medium, a large, or extra large size. Once you put that size, once you put that application, and your application will be running in the hardware or the uh, available compute which is provided. If it is a small, you get a limited access. If it is extra large, you get more access. So, so that's the difference here. That's the Azure as uh, before that, uh, I didn't tell about web role and worker role. The, uh, uh, the PaaS offering, the Azure service cloud services are the first services which were, uh, or the they were the pioneer services which were offered in terms of a cloud by Azure. VMs, websites are new. They are available only from July, but whereas web roles and worker roles are available right from right away from 2009. Uh, web roles are web phrasing front ends. You can put your ASP.NET, ASP.NET MVC, WCF, Web API, or whatever the things, uh, all the things which require some web phrasing. That is, what are the things which require an IAS can be put in a web role. And your background processes, your uh, email sending, your process, your number crunching, batch process, all those things can be made to run in a worker role. Uh, although uh, the web role and worker role are just specified, the difference what it makes is only the availability of IAS or the absence of IAS. Availability makes it a web role, and uh, if you take off the IAS from that, it will be a worker role. Okay. Uh, the end, the rest of the things are same. The size, uh, the pricing, the cost, the features, the platforms, the frameworks, etc. Everything, everything is the same. When you, that is, uh, console application or the, uh, not, sorry, not the console application, the background process which you don't require and web facing front end, make it running, uh, make it run as a worker role, and uh, the web role for all your web front end and web based activities will be from your web role, okay? This is Azure as a task. Azure as IAS. So this is relatively new. It is only from July 7th, I guess. Uh, July 7th, Azure as IAS has come, okay? Uh, you would uh, just bring in a VM. That is, VM, you would select, it is same as the sizes. There are sizes for this also. Uh, just like uh, small, uh, there is not extra small, I guess. Small, medium, large, extra large, okay? Uh, 
you could select i want the size of a medium machine it should run cent os it should run windows server 2012 it sh- it should run windows server 2008 or 2 or it should run open ssh um uh, windows server 2008 or 2 windows server 2012 cent os ubuntu open ssh sql server 2012 distributed servers okay leaving off the sql server 2012 and distributed servers all those are the operating system variants which you could select as it is uh, you could just take an ubuntu server put it in an azure vm start it run and uh, it will be given an public uh, you will be given an url to access it okay you can take that url put your uh, 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 you can use any of the client side uh, uh, shell client shell clients like putty uh, just put your url you administrator username password connect login that's it that essence that entire operating system console is with you at uh, you could install mysql you could uninstall mysql you can install java over that uh, you could install ruby etc whatever you want you can do etc whatever you want to do you can do it with the vm so that is the level so coming down oh, uh, sql server 2012 and distrack server uh, those are the products the those are the proprietary products of microsoft okay uh, the sql server 2012 uh, will be installed over at windows server over and windows server 2012 version same thing with distrack distrack i'm not sure of the what version they support they use distrack and install it over at windows server 2012 and provide you uh so with this uh, it is like uh, an accessory or the top up what you can do it over the vm uh, taking an windows server 2012 instance then downloading the start server then then installing then configuring the, all those things could be little prob a little trouble so when you are sure of whether if you are sure of your vms will be in database based vm you will go with a sql server 2012 instance and instead of uh, heavy lifting uh, heavy lifting and complex installation and other other things unless and until you don't you are fine with the basic configuration or default configuration you can take the pre built a pre built vms of sql server and distrack server so this is azure as iaas okay uh these are the portfolio of azure and its components before getting into each one of them individually uh let's pause a moment and see if there are any questions yes wilman has a question sql server version will not work uh it's not like it won't work it is more like uh, uh you can take on windows server 2008 r2 download a sql server 2000 install it and then leave it okay uh, that is the power of vm or the, that's how you do it with vm but whereas the sql server 2012 vm comes with 2012 installed okay uh, so that is when you would use sql server 2012 uh can you hear me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll go on now. yeah actually uh if i want to deploy an uh, like so a uh, bistock server 2010 on mm-hmm. the cloud mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. my data with my database okay okay so how okay. can i proceed with that what are the like uh, requirements like recommended requirements for it to deploy it on the uh, cloud there are no specific requirements the requirements what you dictate will be done in cloud so as you have bistock and database say let's assume you are sql server 2008 okay sql server 2008 r2 you can take a fresh image of windows server 2008 r2 okay then install then install sql server 2008 and then install bistock and configure so what had happened you all your servers are running that is your windows server is running in cloud and you install the software what you required the sql server and bistock and then made your then you could give access to your application so okay, all I these things mean, are running in cloud okay i just okay? mean to say that uh, can i migrate my current scenario like a uh, uh, servers to the new one uh, to the cloud server directly from like making a copy yeah definitely 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 okay that is 100% possible and uh, uh, microsoft assure wants to get into those kind of activities 
so that's why they have started offering vms azure vm okay yeah Okay. So I need a particular, uh, so I need a particular VM for that to install my Windows. Windows Server 2008 R2 VM. That's it. Okay. 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 Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Mm, so, uh, any questions? Good question by Wilburn. And uh, do we have any other clarifications, questions? a uh, little bit more explanation required in pass or anything like that. so can we continue can you explain pass again definitely okay uh uh shubha can we difference between pass and ias very good okay um okay uh which one is more clear pass or ias for you so that i could compare the concept okay uh, let me tell you in simple words in ias you get the access from operating system in paas you get the access from the platform okay uh what i mean by you get the access from operating system you can select i want an linux vm or a windows based vm so when you get you get to choose what operating system you want during the uh, 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 formation of vms that is the um, virtual machine uh, that is you get to pick what operating system so uh, with that uh, that makes it an infrastructure service that is you get access to the raw infrastructure by specifying what operating system you want and that marks an infrastructure as a service whereas in pass you get to choose only about what framework you want either it's a dotnet framework or you want a php over that and uh, the bottom neither the beneath all the uh, things are the same windows uh, windows server 2008 r2 is the platform what you need to do okay uh, you will get dotnet framework 4.5 this is uh, microsoft uh, started supporting dotnet framework 4.5 some 2 3 weeks ago earlier it was only 4 4.5 is the new version of the platform what they are using uh you speak uh, that is you already bring the application you only worry about either you need a php or you need a dotnet a dotnet of 4.5 or 4 is what uh, 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 when you do all all those activities then that is a pass paas platform as a platform as a service whereas the same vm you speak about operating systems i need an uh, uh, ubuntu uh, on the ubuntu on my vm i want open suse on my vm i want debian on my vm i want centos on my vm i want windows on my vm so those are the things in ias so is it clear or shall i further uh, explain you scaling up and scaling down is also done by the user scaling up a vm is far more uh, different that is far more difficult far more sophisticated scaling up uh, pass is relatively easier uh, i would explain you about cloud patterns and architectures tomorrow how an application be architected about uh, so that is existing architecture you have how do you put it in cloud how do you scale it how do you manage that uh, on an conceptual basis i would explain you uh, at that time i will tell you about how those uh, how scaling a vm uh, how scaling an iaas is different from how scaling a pass is different so just hold that question until tomorrow and tomorrow we'll discuss about that okay so is it fair is it clear now iaas paas saas okay uh, along with this saas pass iaas uh, some people offer uh, um, data as a service even microsoft has something called as they don't name it as data as a service but uh, there are few ads you can um, 
you can get access to list of uh, tourist places in singapore uh, a list of environmental and other uh, weather data bing translation data uh, address data all those things as a service from microsoft uh bin translation is somewhat uh, relatively famous uh but what you could do is you could send a piece of text or a string to the web service of the data that is microsoft azure bin translation bin translation is a service running under uh, azure you could pass on the string and uh, you could just specify what is the uh, for uh, language what you are sending and you could specify what is the output language what you require and it gets translated so you would be billed based on for 5000 translations or 5000 accesses it is free and beyond that for every 1000 translations or 1000 uh, accesses you need to pay 1 dollar or 2 dollar etc uh, you need to select a plan so those kind of services is called as a data as a service there are a lot of things as network as a service dns as a service elasticity as a service a uh, lot of third party players have come in and they started naming their own it's good uh, it's good and it is it is one of the evidences that cloud is continually growing and cloud has really good uh, acceptance in market so uh, we are not sure about how enterprises deal the, um, the what i'm trying to say is you don't know the real thing which are going behind the enterprises whereas um, on seeing third party tools like these we could say that uh, uh, clouds adoption is really good so that is what i mean to say okay azure and azure components azure cloud services is the first uh, the uh, one of the services which are offered from very long time and uh, azure and it forms as a pass we had a pretty uh, brief discussion about uh, cloud services pass and how azure offers that pass and what how good or how deep you get access to it azure virtual machines are the ias ones azure websites are also a little bit like a pass you just bring your application deploy it uh, we would see a uh, uh, working copy i mean how do you set up a spin and azure website with easy in the afternoon session today azure mobile services is the newest i could say that that is the newest service which azure has brought in uh, before i go to azure mobile services let me tell about sql databases it is the same database which uh, you use except that it has a little bit of cut down features um uh, example you don't get the access to master database uh, you don't get to attach profiler there are few bit of restrictions okay but those restrictions are right now uh, microsoft is continuously working to support uh, many of those uh, many of the features to match your sql server and the sql azure sql data azure the people call this as azure sql databases earlier it was called as sql azure okay sql azure uh, azure sql database uh, is nothing but the database as a service i could say uh, that database as a service what uh, what you essentially can do is uh, in uh, azure sql database you could specify either you need your edition to be web edition or an business edition okay the web editions has sizes of 1 gb 2 gb 3 gb etc in an increment of until 5 gb whereas uh, business editions have increment from 10 20 30 etc so on until 150 gb um both are the two differences the storage size is what it is different uh typically managing a database or using a database requires a very 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 sophisticated and you need experts and expert database administrators to handle your thing with database as a service you need not worry about that you just need to tell say uh, boss i need a business edition of 4 gb here go start so once you start it you get access to uh, once you start it you will be given a uh, url username password that username is an essay it's not it's not an essay uh, not an essay that is essay with a master's uh, access essay with the your database instance 
system administrator. You get to choose the administrator name as well as password and you will be testing few of the IPs to allow uh, the database to be connected via this IP etc. We will see that session in the afternoon. We will spawn up a website, we will spawn up a SQL Azure and uh, we will see uh, how things are going on in that. Okay. For now it is a database as a service that is SQL, Azure SQL databases. And uh, next big thing is Azure Storage. Azure Storage is offered in three, actually four. The fourth one is a little bit of extension kind of thing. The three things are Table, Blob, and Queue. The fourth one is Azure Drive. Azure Drive is a little bit like extension extension to Blob. I'll I'll come to that later. Okay. Table. Uh, your Azure Table is. Uh, okay, before this storage, do you have any questions on SQL databases? I am expecting at least two here. Am I right? Any questions on Azure SQL databases? No. Wow. So I take the signal as to proceed. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, Azure table, blob, queue, and drive. A table is not your relational table. What you create, what you could have, things like uh, referential integrity, uh, references, uh, foreign keys, unique constraint, null constraint, indexes. Uh, triggers, uh, replications, views, etc. These tables are something different. It is similar to the big table of what Google is providing and it is like simple table, simple DB of what Amazon is providing. Okay. Um, here in uh, tables, in Azure tables, uh, it is same, row based. It is row by row by based, but um, uh, it can have nearly a billion, a trillion rows, not at all a problem. It can have a billion rows, absolutely no problem about that. Okay, you, they have something called as partition key and row key. Uh, the combination of partition and row key un makes that row uniquely identifiable. Okay. The, uh, for now, you could say that the combination, uh, that is, uh, partition key, row key, can be termed as a combined primary key for the table to, to bring in the concept of relational databases. Okay, uh, partition keys make the logical separation of the tables. Okay, uh, today we will try to create or we will see whether we could, we will have the theory of tables, blobs and queues today and we will create few of the tables, few of the blobs tomorrow. Okay. Uh, um, these tables need not be a schema specific. You could first insert primary key, partition key, store ID, store name. And the second row can be uh, primary key, partition key, username, password. And they both can be in the same table. Absolutely no problem. So these are all NTT, I mean schema-less phases. You just dump in data, 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 data. Uh, you, are, you will not be worried about uh, what data type it is, what this is. This. It will simply accept whatever the data possible provided it does not collides with the partition key on the row key combination. That's the only thing. So partition key separates with each uh, each set of records with uh, each partition key can have any number of uh, basically it can have any number of rows and querying and the unique identification of the record is based on partition combination of primary key and part, uh, row key and primary partition key. Partition key uh, separates each of the uh, sub tables in terms of uh, uh, locations. Say uh, you are you have uh, ten different stores, and uh, partition key can be the store name, and the row key can be the date. 
okay uh, how much of profit has been done so internally uh, internally in terms of storage it will logically partition store a data separately store b data separately store c data separately this is for faster retrieval of reading and fetching the records and manipulating on them uh if you don't have any partition or any of the logic you don't need any logical separation to it what you could do is you could name a constant to be your partition key and you could just change row key so this is the example where you just have one store and uh, you could just say partition key as just a single alphabet a or my store and uh, just have the date as the row key and have your data about the store day to day and just keep continuing that is how table works out okay i spoken a lot of things about table without any slides so have i will show something in the afternoon session okay uh, blob is uh, as we know it is a binary large object uh, blob can store any digital binary digital by go sorry any binary data upload an exe upload a jpeg upload a gif upload a png upload a txt file upload your own cs file uh, um, whatever you want you just upload it and you can keep it in the blob okay uh, blobs have the folder like structure or you could say it is like folder containers are the logical separations for blob each blob can have n number of containers and each container can have n number of blobs blobs are the objects uh, okay um uh, they can have permissions at the blob level permissions at the container level etc okay um this is with the blob apart from that what's there in it uh, blob i guess that's it q are the q as you will be aware of the data structure of first in first out it has the structure to maintain uh, message data in the first in first out format um, um the combination of table blob and queue are used left right and center to make enterprise level high scalable and high available applications um everybody uses that is we all use uh, facebook right uh, facebook uh, when somebody tags you in a photo somebody likes your article somebody shares your uh, wall or somebody sent you a friend request all those things are there internally you get emails for all those things how it is happening so how facebook i mean facebook has a very very massive architecture to do that uh, so in simple words if i say if anybody has sent you the friend request uh, the friend request uh, task or the item will be put in the sm email queue okay the email queue will be read by a big process okay it will say uh, steve smith has sent friend request to anna mary so uh, it will just pick up steve smith's facebook id uh, put a compose a message take uh, anna smith's uh, email id and send and uh, there could be nearly hundreds and thousands of emails need to be sent and there will be one worker looking into queue take the queue object look at what is the message uh, process that message send that message and take the and dequeue that message from the queue so these things will go on and on and on and on and on so this is where you will use queue and cdn is really cool uh, cdn people call it as content distribution network and or content uh, delivery network okay uh, before coming to the cdn do we have any doubts so far uh the reason being cdn is a little uh, little uh, deep topic okay let's uh it's uh, it's a cool uh, uh we can have a, a a milestone until uh the storage and see if there is anything because i'll be using blobs to explain cdn any questions okay let me proceed uh 
Akamai or uh, they are the people who use, uh, they, they are the providers for CDN. Uh, just like Akamai, there are people like CloudFront for Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, Azure CDN is a CDN. Uh, there are a lot of CDNs. Okay. Essentially, what a CDN is, I can explain you with, um, I don't think that I will be. So currently, uh, let's say you are uh, from uh, Hyderabad. Okay, you uh, your server, that is your server, is from um, California, USA. Okay, uh, every time when you access your application from uh, Hyderabad, uh, it could the the Hyderabad might send the um, routing to Bombay and from Bombay it would be sent to, um, uh, it might be sent to UK, from UK it will go to Fiberlink, uh, um, fiber optic cables uh, to USA, from USA it will get it from Washington DC and from Washington DC it can send it to, uh, my desktop is not visible. I have just taken the notepad, okay? Let me just go forward and uh, show you where are the locations of data center for Azure. So this is the world map and here we see East Asia is the location for um, Hong Kong. Uh, uh, ignore the actual point of location. East Asia is Hong Kong. Southeast Asia is Singapore. West Europe is uh, Netherlands. Northern Europe is Ireland. Uh, west is uh, Northern California, East I think uh, it is Virginia, South might be Texas, yeah South is Texas and North will be I think it is Chicago. Okay, So these are the eight locations where Azure data centers are available. Okay, um, You get the compute access, VMs, um, uh, virtual machine, cloud services, mobile services, SQL Azure databases. So all these, all these things will be spoken in the context of location, which region. So we will be South Central US, East US, North Central US, etc. So there are uh, very, there are, um, you need to look at uh, what are the sites which uh, really has, uh, I mean, what are the regions which have all the services. For example, the essential services like uh, cloud, uh, Azure cloud services, cloud storage, um, SQL, uh, Azure SQL databases, uh, virtual networks, all those things are available in all the eight. There are some disturbances. Um, there was some, and I think, um, well done, there are some disturbances. Um, Narsima, if you're online, you can just mute all of these participants. Vangi, uh, Narsima is muted. Ankit is muted. Nanta is muted. Um, is this fine now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me continue. Okay. Um, uh, not all services are available in all the regions. Okay. Um, Azure uh, Cloud Services, that is the past version of Azure and uh, storage, SQL databases, virtual networks, everything. Uh, those things, those essential things are available on all the eight regions. And rest of them, uh, there are also one service, which is uh, Azure Mobile Service here, if you see. Um, Azure Mobile Service is only available in East US. East US is the first data center, the main data center, the big data center, the massive data center, etc. Okay, uh, those are available only in this. Slowly, those things will be made available in all the other data centers, 
and um, that's that's how the azure takes it data center by data center okay uh, here moving back azure storage table blob q drive uh, i started with cdn even before that uh, i i would just take a little bit a little deeper introduction on table okay uh, these are the four storage things as we were earlier blob drive table queues uh blob files along with the metadata you will you will be able to store the binary data as well as the metadata with drive is just an example this is just an extension of blob you will take this blob and make it as a drive you could assume this as a pen drive for the uh, cloud okay what you could do is you could take a blob of sizes of nearly even 1 terabyte that is 1024 gb is also uh, acceptable okay you can just take it and mount it as a uh as an external drive and once you mount it you can uh for in order to copy pasting that is you have an instance data in one you can mount a drive um paste or copy the data put it in it and you can unmount that drive and remount the drive in different data so these are the scenarios where you would use drives tables is storage flash well as sinister structured storage semi structured storage you would use entities in the <coughs> excuse me you would use entities and other things <coughs> to support uh, a primary key partition key to support a relational a semi relational and relational kind of an approach you won't get extensive features of what you had all everything in an rdb ms table but a little bit of form this is predominantly or this is mainly as you in using large rows of data large volumes of data and uh, which don't require the functionality of relational joins uh, triggers etc queues first and first out a delivery mechanism okay table uh, uh, table account is the name of the storage account here the example is contesco uh, i took the example from the microsoft's a uh, little bit documentation i had somewhere i just took a screenshot of it and i just showing it okay a contesco is a table account name you can create a account say cdk tech that will be the account name and inside an account you can create n number of tables here for contesco it is customers and photos for customers you can have name email name email address photo id date photo id date etc um, the thing what you need to drive here is name email name email add is also acceptable okay uh, i started by uh, telling uh is it not that clear okay um partition key row key okay uh then the field could be store name these are the column names okay store name um uh, profit partition key can be one row key can be um say one store name store one profit is profit is 100 so above and second thing can be you can have partition key is also one there is a full hand of the two partition key row key store name profit so we have 10 partition keys so row key can be one okay you can have store name of store one
okay this is a perfectly acceptable uh, perfect acceptable example for a table you can you cannot have one and one here this will throw an exception and you cannot complete the transaction you can have this kind of an arrangement okay you can uh, let me take this example this is not acceptable this one won't be acceptable you can just change it to 2 or a or 2 a or whatever is it okay it can be up to 8 kb of data each each row okay uh, it has to be alphanumeric you cannot have the, uh, symbols like this mm, you cannot have symbols like um, this 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 and this for uh, querying, you will be using this. That is, this is a RESTful bit service call. All the Azure services are available as part of RESTful services. This slash, this slash can interfere with the URL pattern, etc., and access pattern. At the rate, will also be part of URLs and other things. Okay, hash will be the URL format fragment. Okay, what? Uh, so these things are not acceptable characters. Despite that, if you need these, what you could do is, if for this, you can internally store it as QWQWE and will be A. When you query it back, you'll search for this string and you can re, uh, you can, uh, what is it, you can encode this on, if you, if your real data has a break, you can have your own custom data, something which uh, you will never get it, okay, uh, these kind of data won't generate it, won't be generated. You can translate this upgrade to something like this. You could insert it, and once again, when the event of retrieval, if you find this string, you you can uh, do a string replace to upgrade and get back the real data. That is how you will be doing that. Okay. Uh, now coming back to the one, and uh, this is acceptable. And I have one. The store uh, this is eleven. Use uh, then you can have. User name password user one password one. This is also acceptable. This table and normal table and database. Okay, here. Okay. Um, the difference here, uh, you cannot have, uh, if your table structure is in your relational database, you have ID, username, password. Okay. Can you insert ID, student, student name, and uh, role number in the same thing? Okay. Uh, user uh, username is a character type, password is a character type, uh, student name is uh, uh, is again a varchar and roll number is and assume that it is an integer. You cannot insert this, uh, the data type, the specification, the name, everything has to be here, okay. This corresponds to the, this set of entities, okay, and this corresponds to these entities. Here, if you see. These corresponds to these entities, and this corresponds to these entities, and the end result is these correspond to these entities, but they are all part of the same table. This is the thing. Here you are interested in the, you are only interested in the row key and partition key, and the rest of the schema can be different. Got it? Uh, what is the real advantage of this? I actually don't know. This, I don't know whether this is a huge advantage or this is how the design is or not really. 
these are schema free design you cannot do a join you cannot do uh, uh, what are the things you cannot do a sub query kind of a thing all those things are not possible okay you can just query a data from a partition key to row key take a specific data look at it and once you get back based on your partition key is condition row key is condition you could traverse that and check that okay we will see the coding part of how these things are accessed tomorrow so we will cover the theory part okay okay the usage of var you could use the tables is um uh, a log uh, event log access log application log these kind of logging things can be used in the table uh the logs require just the entry and they do not instead of writing it in a flat file and storing it etc you could import in this table which is really 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 cheap which costs only 10 cents for 1 gb 10 cents per gb so assume a dollar of the rupees and 10 cents will be 55 55 so for a gb of table data table data you can query it in real time using partition key and row key one consideration what you need to do is partition key and row key has to be part of your values okay uh, assuming you are using this uh, you are using this you could, uh, you need to make the partition key a value of your table uh, for logging you can make a partition key as partition key as um, uh, the system id or the host name from which sends the log and um, uh row key should be a date or a time stamp etc so end of the day the partition key and row key a combination of them should be unique that's the only consideration or the only thing which you need to concentrate here so this is with the table so clear or uh, shall i stop again and uh, any uh, any other question can i move forward Hey, Navin. One question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these we are discussing the, these things: the table, blob, uh, queue, drives. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand. Means this, there is a SQL database is also there. So these are this is all uh, comes under uh, Azure and components. What are all these? Means your cloud services, your virtual machines. Yes. Can you please uh, again uh, okay. define all these? Which one? Blob, drives, and tables, or databases? Where, where, where do we uh, use these? Means, uh, is that a part of uh, uh, while we maintaining a cloud? Uh, these things uh, works there, or uh, whether anyone wants to? All these uh, things are in cloud. All these, all these things are in cloud. Okay. Uh, say you need log. You need to parse logs of one terabyte to two, two terabytes. uh do you really have any database which supports on premise to um, access those kind of data no 1 terabyte is uh, is really really cheaper and when you add keep adding more and more and more uh the cost lab gets reduced say for until 1 terabyte it will be 10 cents from 10 terabytes to 20 terabytes it will be 5 cents um the usage of individual component uh i will again come to this slide and i will tell you with examples where each of these things can be used i told about azure cloud services azure virtual machines and azure website right i will tell you where exactly these things can be used azure uh, i i'll come down and go in detail right now so right now just understand uh, what is table individually what is blob individually what is queue individually and i will take it ahead from that okay uh, i haven't answered your question uh, i'll come back to you okay yeah yeah i'll come back to your question uh, i'll come back to your question okay blob drives table queues so this makes a table uh regarding the blob uh here this is the rest url given for the blob same thing there is for table um so account is the account name what you need will be using blob.core.windows.net/container will be the blob container so do we all store all types of data in a single table 
you can store uh, Shubhakar has asked the question like do we store all types of data in a single table you can uh, you can store any um, string slash numeric slash float type of data in a table okay you store everything you can have any number of tables okay you store everything in one table and separate it by a partition key or row key is up to you okay uh that's actual, purely actually my thing. question is uh, should, uh there is see, there is relational uh, database correct so in case yes, you think right. about a relational database so uh, what uh, in exactly we store in this uh, cloud uh, table uh, as a table so all data in a single table or we maintain the relational relations if you need any relation between the tables you should go for sql databases that is relation databases and in okay. azure storage table you are not advised to have any relation between the tables you can but if uh, if you need relation you could go for a better doing product for uh, doing that sole uh, doing that sole purpose operation you could go for relation databases here this is to store legacy data or large volumes of data which do not require relational behavior okay 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 i uh, see you have event logs you have application logs do you really need to store it in database no we just need a mechanism to store them and uh, generally we write it in the flat file we'll just write it in the x file and then then leave it if in case we if we need any if we have encounter any problem we'll do control f and go through and see uh, the time stamp date what happened example etc 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 same thing if you write it in a log file you can write it like uh, write it to azure table storage and that will push in and uh, you can query that also so there are a lot of tools available to do that and tomorrow we will see a tool called as azure storage explorer which uh, which will help you to solve these things okay block storage uh, okay and let me come back to blob here uh, container is the logical container for the blob it is like the folder and inside the container you can have blobs okay the blobs can be page blob block blob okay page blobs are one single big block whereas block blobs are smaller components here uh, if you see uh, tick 01.jpg is one single big block whereas tick plc 01.jpg is block block okay what you could essentially do is the tick would be internally separated or split up segmented into small small pieces uh, uh, uh typically the type of data which is segmented into small pieces are videos okay videos being served from a block uh if we if the instead of a 10mb or 20mb or 1gb file being directly accessed from the storage people split it it is still the same file <coughs> but uh, split it as a small 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 segment and push it to the storage and the retrieval will be fast the access will be fast so that's uh, 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 so those are the concepts of speed block and block block so this is a uh, drive table queue so coming to the queue Uh, you could insert a queue message queue message is a specific it's, it's still a string it's a specific uh, what you could do is uh, i told about the facebook example um uh, uh, let's say if you have any friend uh, request being sent friend request sent by friend request sent to time stamp you can append this thing with a delimiter and put it in the queue and some process will read the queue item and look at sent from sent to date time so it will compose the mail sent from it will look at the facebook id sent to facebook id the person's email id and it will put it in the two column and compose the message that the so and so has sent you a friend request go to facebook etc etc and it will compose a message and send it to you and this process will be going on uh, it is just for one person 
imagine there are how many Facebook friends are there and Facebook users are there. So all those people, uh, when we use, uh, essentially to handle multi process or a multiple, um, what is it, multiple, um, it's actually Q, Q is to feed multiple processes. I would explain you, uh, I would explain this with an example, okay? We have a question. MSMQ, yes, it is similar to MSMQ, exactly. Uh, for now, you could say that it is MSMQ for flow. That's correct, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly right. Okay, uh, let me bring in PowerPoint. So what is the this will be our Q. This will be our Q. And uh, there are small, small stars. Okay. okay. Uh, these are the servers which Feed data to this. Okay. Essentially, what happens is these produce data in this fashion. Sometimes there will be a lot of messages, sometimes there will be less messages, etc. Uh, this is the example of the frequency of the new messages being sent, new friend requests being sent. Okay. Okay. Here, what happens, um, at this time, there, there would be 20 friend requests sent. This time, there would be 10 friend requests sent. This time, there would be 15 friend requests sent. And this is for this process. Okay. And uh, what happens, every time, it uh, on any request being sent, there would be a new queue message added. So, uh, all the friend requests will be sent here. And now we will require a work process which will consume from this. Okay, these things will consume, take data one by one in queue and process. So end of the day, what had actually happened here is a load of this behavior, okay, a load of this behavior has become a load of this behavior, okay? The queue is being constantly fed and the data at, uh, at any point in time each will be reading two messages, three messages, etc. These kind of volumes, to neutralize or stabilize these kind of volume data, you use queue. And when you read queue, it's constant, right? Every time you go, take a message. Every time you go, take a message. Uh, queue reading is constant. So this is the graph time versus uh, process. So this is it. So these are the areas. This is exactly where, uh, how MSMQ works. And uh, this is something like MSMQ for flow. Queues. Q is also cheap, same thing with uh, everything else in terms of uh, 10 cents for GBI, I suppose. The rates are coming down like anything and uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper every day and more and more you use, it gets even more cheaper. Earlier it used to be for storage of until 2 terabytes, you need not contact us, all your, uh, all your um, accounts are powered to uh, handle to uh, uh, data size of 2 terabytes. That is, the total volume occupied by queue, total volume occupied by block, total uh, volume occupied by table, all put together until 2 terabytes, no problem. This was before uh, March or April, I guess. After uh, this July, there was a major release this July, that is July 2012. And after that, uh, Microsoft has announced that until, uh, that is earlier, uh, about 2 terabytes, you need to call Microsoft support and you need to say that I have high volume data, I'm exceeding 2 terabytes, kindly provision, then they will provision for no extra charge. But you need to call them and uh, ask 
But uh, now what had happened, Microsoft has improved its data center operations and it, it wants more and more people to use a lot of things. And now from 2 terabytes, they have made it to 20 petabytes, which is very, 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 very high volume. <coughs> I seriously doubt, is there anyone who use more than 20 petabytes for storage? Okay. Log, drive, table, queues. We have seen the table concept, the blob storage concept. Tomorrow when we do it programmatically and when you see it in the tool, you will get a better understanding of the blob. And um, uh, so going back here, uh, we I, we just retook uh, a look on table, blob, queue, drive. Okay. Next we will look at CDN. And uh, for CDN we need a world map. Okay. okay? Uh, guys, uh, fine so far? Okay, good. Okay. CDN is called as Content Delivery Network or Content Distribution Network. Each cloud provider names it in his or uh, the enterprise own way, uh, own style. Okay, uh, for uh, website being loaded, what are the things required? You need base HTML. You uh, a general a general website. You will you will have a HTML. You will have a CSS. You will have JavaScript. You will have images, etc. Okay. When you bring up a website, what will happen? It will first get the HTML. It will look at what are the references requiring, uh, what are the references of file, external files being required. And it will download one by one. And finally, once every download is being completed, the page site, page, uh, website render, or uh, website render task will be completed. So in the process of rendering, even JavaScript, CSS, Images are also external calls, right? Okay. So we are we are in India. When we call uh, an application which is hosted in East US, there will be I think there will be nearly 20 hops it will go, and it needs to compare 20 hops to fetch the data, right? Uh, what happens um, if it is a real core application that is which means every time when you, for each operation, you you go 20, 20 hops, uh, the, uh, this is fine, this is acceptable. But whereas, we need to speed up a very, very big community websites or social websites, etc. What people do is, uh, these are the data center locations. There are something called as CDN nodes. There are nearly 47 CDN nodes across the world, I didn't, uh, okay, I will try to get where are all the CDN nodes available, okay. It is spread across, there is one in Qatar, uh, 10 or 15 in Europe, one in South America, uh, one in Australia, uh, nearly four or five in uh, Asia, and uh, easily 20 to 25 in USA, North America and South America, etc. <coughs> uh, Singapore is nearer to us, okay, there is one CDN node in Singapore, and, uh, and for now let's just take Singapore's uh, CDN node, and what we'll take it for discussion. You will set up your application in a server which is running in USA, fine. So on the first click, on the first thing when you go, it goes and gets the site from East US, the USA inside. And the all the static content or relatively uh, non-changeable, non-dynamic uh, non content like CSS, JavaScript images will be fetched from Singapore. Okay, what the, what does this mean? The critical data alone will be the critical or the website's data, the text data will be uh, fetched from USA and the non, the static, the things like uh, the jQuery scripts, the scripts for each pages, the CSS styles, uh, the images, the footer image, the copyright image, uh, the about us image, the all other images will be fetched from Singapore. Okay, this is the style with India. So let's assume you are in Dubai. Dubai is here. Okay, uh, you access the same site. 
you will go get the critical data or the specific server data from USA and other images will be loaded from Qatar. Exactly, this is cool. Less pressure on bandwidth and also less overhead on the server, on the web server. So this is the real power of CDN. Uh, do you feel, do you feel really, uh, you feel your Facebook and other pages, Facebook type to be extremely fast, right? Because uh, I guess nearly all the photos are available, all the photos you share, all the photos you like, all the videos you see, oh, they are all thrown from CDN. Uh, so you go to San Jose in USA, access it, you go to Dubai, access it, you go to Ireland, access it, you go to Turkey, access it, you go to Kuwait, access it, you go to Australia, access it. The content, the bigger files, the, uh, the um, what is it, uh, the junk, uh, uh, the bulky files, all are, all are pushed to CDN. And only the, uh, the textual, the critical data will be uh, really, really um, third from the servers, and all the load is just distributed or offloaded to the CDN nodes. So this is the real power of uh, CDN, and uh, Azure will continue to build more and more CDN nodes. So more and more CDN nodes means when your target audience are at global scale, your site will be faster and the lesser pressure on your web server and web server and uh, web server, app server, etc. You just uploaded the overall content across the globe to uh, bring the overall site experience really, really good. So this is the CDN. This is the real idea of CDN. How the files are being fetched, uh, it, uh, how does it know that this data center is nearer or this CDN is nearer, etc. All those things are protocols and behind algorithms which, which work at DNS level. So this is CDN. Okay. CDN itself is really, really amazing. And we can spend one full day talking about CDN. And for now, as we are in a fast track or a crash course kind of a thing, we'll move on to next topic. And if there is any time, we'll come back to CDN and see what is the real thing which is happening. Okay. Uh, so any questions in CDN part? Sure, if there is anything, we will just again uh, revisit, okay? So, I missed out the Azure website, I will come back to it. CDN I have told, Azure App Fabric. Uh, ACS is Access Control Services, Service Bus, Cash. Okay, uh, Cash, I will specifically tell about the Cash tomorrow. There will be a lot of discussion about Cash, Virtual Network and Traffic Manager. <coughs> Traffic manager, uh, today I will try to cover, if not I will take it tomorrow. It requires, um, uh, ad, the, all these things help to build architectures for cloud applications, cloud enabled applications. Okay? CDN, I have told, ACS. ACS is, uh, we have a lot of logins like login with Facebook, login with Yahoo, login with Live, login with Twitter etc. Okay. Uh, these kind of services, uh, it is fine. You could use ACS services to check whether you are, uh, you could use them to authenticate them. Okay. Uh, authorization, you will take care. There are two kind of things. One is authentication is to verify who is that person and authorization to uh, evaluate what are all the powers or access things uh, the user has. That is authorization. Instead of you authenticating, you can use access control services to offload the authentication to uh, Azure. And Azure will take care of the authentication and bring back you the token. All these things are token-based things. Okay, I will not go deeper into ACS. ACS is a bigger topic and integration to our application is even bigger and even sophisticated. So, so the base idea is uh, it enables offloading of the single sign on, uh, offloading of single sign on and authentication overhead to the Azure, and rest of the things you can take care. Uh, um, when a user comes to you, you will just redirect to the ACS site, ACS site, and the user will authenticate using Google, Yahoo, or whatever the um, authenticators you configure. Once you have configured, you will give back the 
callback URL. So with the callback URL, you will you will re-enter your application, and the Azure will return back the token saying the user is authenticated or not authenticated. And once it is authenticated, you know what to do. That is, you would authorize, give access to the pages, etc. If it is not authorized, you will redirect to the login page with the error message saying not authorized, etc. Uh, so these things, uh, these are the part, these are the things which you could do with APS. Okay. Next comes the service bus. Service bus is something um, you can access the website which you have deployed in Azure. Uh, from your local laptop. Easy. You just give the URL and find it out. But whereas when an Azure, when an Azure instance requires your local data center or if it needs to contact that, uh, contact your physical machine, how will it do? No. It's not possible, right? Uh, there are a lot, it's not possible it's in the sense it is really difficult. Uh, you will go and access it via a public IP or a URL. So which one the Azure website? But whereas when the Azure application, when it wants to come back and gets a, a critical data or some data from your local mission, what you could do is you could run a service bus from a service bus from uh, your uh, uh, your local server connecting to. The Azure Azure instance. Essentially, think what you could, what you should see is uh, your laptop inside your enterprises will be blocked by firewalls, blocked by um, DHCPs, local IPs, uh, network address translations, etc. If you open up your CMD and just do 192, uh, you will just do an IP config, you will get your IP addresses 192.168.168.0.1. If you go to any external internet center or open up your uh, mobile phone, if you type 192.168.0.1, will you get your default IAS page, if, uh, default IAS page? No. Because all those things are behind the NAT. NAT meaning NAT uh, is network address translation. Those are all virtual IP. But whereas the servers will take the real public IP, how will the server contact you if under, under the conservation? So what happens is that uh, there will be one open connection, outbound connection from the server, and your system accessing uh, your uh, laptop, they're, they're contacting your laptop from external sources is little difficult. Whereas your laptop contacting an external service is easy. That's how uh, you just go open an outbound port. So this outbound will be open to, will be connected to your Azure's mission. Okay. So with this, there will be a communication completion, and you could pass messages. Pass. There, there, uh, you can also maintain a queue of what are the messages being sent, and you could set up things like publish, publisher, subscription, etc. Inside the service bus. Uh, service bus uh, is cool, but uh, I don't know what are the real real fields where uh, uh, service bus is being used. So that if you take a look at Azure's case study for service bus, I think we can get some idea. So any questions in Azure service bus? Okay, fine. Now we have uh, roughly at three o'clock. We have one and a half hours to go. A uh, lot of people will say, "Why ask this question? Why Azure?" Why? Okay, so before that, uh, I have left Azure website, and the virtual network traffic manager cache will be tomorrow with the architecture and uh, mobile services. Mobile services is specifically targeted to uh, handle mobile-based web services calls. Uh, you have a lot of applications running. That is a lot of your mobile apps running in your phone, like uh, Twitter, um, Angry Birds, a lot of apps are there. Okay. These apps require uh, a backend medium for data access, Data, uh, data access, retrieval, new data, insertion, etc. 
mobile web, mobile services help you build easy mobile web services uh, uh, easy web services which are uh, which will consume via json you will feel in json you will get that json which uh, acts as a over your sql azure database uh, uh, let's say the simple operation for the database will be crud operation crud operation crd operation okay the same operation there will be a layer over the the sql azure databases and you can use your mobile apis to call the mobile services so these are the things which you would do with mobile services right now mobile services is the newest feature which is available from azure only out of us east virginia data center rest of the things are there in majority of the data center the adoption for this is again i'm not sure where the real where the real use of it um that's it with mobile services okay uh, why azure um, we all are dotnet programmers or we have developed applications we have run applications on microsoft platform okay uh, we know how good is windows server uh, um, uh, let's not get, let's not get into the debate of windows versus linux let's see how sophisticated and how easy access they give to our applications are uh, running in windows server and sql server for a very long time and for uh, uh, with a with a good performance and it is the same microsoft product called azure the same skill set what you have used for your windows server and the sql server you will be using it the same thing in azure adding two numbers is not at all difficult but adding uh, 200 million numbers is definitely a problem the same thing here applies so far you have handled the load for few hundreds of users or few thousand you may have used for few hundreds of users or three thousands of users but doing it in the cloud scale making it automatic scale up automatic scale down is something which you need to do it in a real 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 uh, uh, real time doing it in the real time and crunching the huge data uh, in the real time and using sophisticated algorithms and you could arrive at any algorithm and you could do whatever you want but so far there was a problem of where do you keep that much data and where do you get so powerful machines and uh, this is the age of uh, getting any machine uh, any power of any any powerful machines at your disposal uh, terabytes of data was something which we were not at all we, which we were um, imagining for very long time that cloud makes it possible a terabyte of data a petabyte of data all those things are used now uh, the application how you are written the asp.net application the asp.net the mvc application all the applications which you used so far you would use the same skill set to deploy your machines in azure if the sql what you wrote it uh, you want to wrote in your sql server the same sql will run they work in sql server the sql azure version of the cloud so um, uh, if you are already in microsoft platform for you to get yourself landed in azure platform is not at all difficult and it will accelerate your overall career grade every single enterprise is looking at cloud adoption now or the uh, now or so sooner or later the later is not sooner but uh, the so the later is not that far away but still um but still every company is looking at using cloud okay there are new features which are constantly updated and uh, azure mobile services was the new thing and there are a lot of updates sdks the management portal getting updated the tools being released the the, uh, the community for the azure are getting more and more and day by day Coding in cloud. I really like and uh, so given a task in any cloud, I'll first take this coding in cloud evaluation and then go ahead and do the architecture and evaluation. Okay. Um, um, doing something optimal is the real skill or the real art of doing. That is, 
uh, you can say uh, how um, how do you go from Chennai to Delhi? You could say you could take a flight, but not all will be able to afford for a flight. So you will arrive at the train or the bus or where do you change, etc. Finding an optimal solution. Say I want this program to run uh, run in five minutes. You could say just put this in hundred servers and make it run to run them together. You will get it. The cost of hundred servers. And how do you make the same work get done by fewer of five or four servers uh, and achieve the same task being done? That, that, that's where the real uh, work or the art life. Okay. Yes, coming to the, the, uh, the, the thing why I told about that is everything involves cost. Every single thing in, in cloud is, is being charged. There is nothing like uh, free or anything like that. It is based on usage and how much ever you use, how much ever uh, you consume, you only pay for that. Uh, with that said, there are a lot of people who do the mistakes of running the server and forgetting it to stop, forgetting it to uh, <coughs> stop, stop the missions, uh, forgetting it to kill the missions or uh, forgetting to delete the data or remove the data from storage or table or blobs, etc. You would still, for all those mistakes, you would be built. And uh, that is, uh, according to Microsoft or according to any cloud provider, forgetting an instance to kill, no, I forgot to kill, but I not used it, I not at all used it, but uh, we still need to pay, all those things are there. Okay, pay so, yeah, as you go is postpaid. That is, you only pay for how much you use, how much you don't use. Uh, let's bring up the Excel again. Let's go to Sheet. Okay, here. Let's say I'll just use as compute instance. This could be for, uh, this could be for, um, I'll just bring in the, I'll just zoom. This involves VM services, cloud services, websites. Okay. You would be billed for running time of the instance. If you run for one hour, you would be paying. Uh, uh, you would be paying X. Let's say the cost of running one server is X. So if you run for one hour, you'll be paying for one x. If you run for hundred hours, you'll just pay for hundred x. As simple as that. So running time of the instances. And next is the out band set. Amount of data sent from your instances. So all those things are. Uh, this is per hour. This is per hour. Uh, out bandwidth is per GB per month. Okay, these are the two major costs for the instances. So now coming to storage, running does not apply. Uh, this is also per GB per month. And next order is. Everything falls under these concepts, one or the other. A database, it is for, uh, database is alone per GB per month. Same thing, uh, there is no, per GB per month. Uh, it is, database is separate, there is no instances or anything like that. Okay, uh, the question was, Wilburn, for storage disk space, very good question. Uh, we have the sizes called as, uh, we have the sizes like small, medium, uh, you first have extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. Okay. Um, uh, okay, tomorrow I'll get you those details. Extra large, what is the number of cores for small is? It's a share core for small one, medium two, large four, eight cores, I guess. I guess 
this is core this number of cpus number of processors uh, number of cores okay uh, what is the disk space i think this is this is 2 terabyte i guess I, i'll make this details tomorrow okay uh, uh you only pay for the size of this you uh, let's assume medium instance workload around uh, 50 cents per hour okay uh this one assume if it comes with 300 gb uh your c drive the root drive won't be 300 gb it might be somewhere around uh, uh for c drive it's called as the root space or the disk space okay and uh, there will be other spaces for nearly around 100 gb or 200 gb those data will be lost on the event of reboot reinstall or there would be several data center activities say uh, the data center will separate each instance based on rack so let's assume you are the only person who your your server is the only server running in your rack so what it can do it can turn off your machine from your rack and bring back the same same in internal vm in some other machine on these kind of activities on these kind of activities uh, the other data the other drive data will be lost the other drive data people call it as ephemeral storage okay ephemeral storage will be lost on the event of the uh the one thing what we could do is uh ephemeral storage can be used as a temporary spaces and other so what you could do is if that's, that's the reason why you you have the notion of blobs and tables uh the the temporary log files they can be zipped they all can be zipped and pushed to blobs okay and the logs can be written in a uh, table uh, azure table okay so uh, when you write it in azure table or azure blob it is persistent it is not uh, it is persistent it will stay unlike the other instances uh, which will go uh, the ephemeral data and all those things will go okay these are the few catches or gotchas which you need to take care when using cloud uh, with it i told a very very a uh, lot of people get frightened with the term uh, when i tell the point uh the data center that is the data center controller or the fabric controller what people say it for sure fabric controller uh is the one which will look at each of your instance health at any point in time it will look at the instance uh instance will say you are the only person your your application is the only application running in this rack it will take that it will cut down the server from that rack and put another uh, look for uh, application which uh, we will put, uh, look for the rack which has uh, vacant space or empty space and it will reboot that application there and during this process your site may be down so that's why people bring in the concept of high availability so these kind of activities so why these kind of activities what cloud provider suggests is when you host your application you you are not advised to host your application in single instance instead you will be asked to store it <coughs> in at least two instances so even when you deploy what will happen is when you deploy when you say your instance count is 1 automatically there will be a pop up message saying microsoft azure commits its sla sla is service level agreement service level agreement of 95.99% up 99.995% up time only if the given service is deployed in more than one server so what happens when you deploy in at least two this will ensure that your application your your website is up and running in at least one server and traffic controller will take care that it won't migrate both the servers at the same time it will try uh, it will it will do its best to avoid migrating both the sites or all the instances from one rack to other and other database activities uh, other database activities at the same time which 
bill or which may bring in the concept of inconsistency or your web applications uh, going down and applications failure. So these are the things which uh, you need to take care of the cloud. Okay, I think this is heavy, heavy, heavy topics in cloud. The topics, the topics which I discussed are really, really heavy. Okay. Why are you passing in cloud? I told about data out, storage, compute, bandwidth, and other charges. Other charges. I just put it as other. What are the other charges? Other charges. So far. Storage and out bandwidth are the only thing which are the culprits which bring in the charges. Earlier, even the in. So this will work as a backup. Yes, that will burn. This will work as a backup. Uh, you would make use of your blogs and tables to intelligently or smartly look at how how uh, well to architect your uh, uh, overall architecture, uh, overall application, so that there isn't any downtime. Either you do it, or either the fabric control does that. You you are not uh, you are not uh, suffered by those problems. Okay. Uh, now I told about out bandwidth. Uh, one year ago, until very recently, uh, not one year, it's more than a year. Um, here I told about out bandwidth. There would be also called as in bandwidth. That will also be charged per GB per month. And now what they are doing is zero. So in bandwidth is free, that is. Whatever or how much ever you upload to database, upload to your Azure Azure instances, it is free. Again, if you store it, again if you store it in blog or in data. Oh, my God.